Hello, welcome everyone to our 195th 98 Crisis Jam, where we're going to be talking about the intersection of mental health and criminal justice with Jennifer Mathis as our featured speaker. I'm Dr. Chuck, uh, Chuck Browning. I'm the CEO and President of Behavior Health Link and the Chief Medical Officer of Strategy for Recovery Innovations. And thank you all to the Crisis Jam. As always, if you're seeing this on YouTube, um, and, need, and want to know how to be able to uh, be able to get live onto the Crisis Jam, where we also have the great features with our chat features and those uh, elements. Please register here at this link. You need your own individualized link. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out: when you go back and do searches and want to see past shows in this video material section, to the right of the videos, other than seeing those, you can actually view all past materials and get a history of PowerPoints and other details. So that can be really helpful when you're researching particular topics from this rich history of things that we've had. Last week, we had Stephen O'Connor doing a presentation about early intervention and, uh, and considerations after a suicide from the NIMH. Uh, that was a really powerful uh, discussion. And now we're gonna get to the news. So I, I'm a, I already know from looking at the participant list that lots of us were at this event last week it was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona area at the Arizona Grand Crisis Con Conference, which if I'm not mistaken, I think it had over 900 plus people there. So just extremely uh, diverse group of people presenting lots of different topics. I had multiple sessions where I needed to clone myself, split into three or four to be able to go see all the different topics that I wanted to cover and 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 take take note of. It's, uh, this again was led by the International Council for Hotlines, uh, the Crisis Residential Association and TBD Solutions. Um, Heather spoke about it, I think, a few weeks ago to intro the, it coming. I thought it was a fantastic event and will be um, a rich source of future ideas of things to present, um, as well as uh, encourage you to be thinking about next conference for next year because it gets uh, sold out pretty quickly. Is there anybody, let's see, I didn't, I didn't even look to see if Heather or Travis or someone will be on here that would like to speak about it for just a second. So I don't see it on here. Well, I will tell you it was a great event, and we'll be covering some more things coming from that event as we go forward. Other things in the news, um, there's an update on the FCC. They did approve geo for 98 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which is going to, I think, hitting the, talking about, the article talks about the timelines for some of the larger telecare um, platforms as well as then moving on to smaller and then uh, having an open discussion about the chat text feature and about possibly moving towards geo routing in in that series as well so that was in the abc news link and then david passed on this podcast uh, which will have a link in the chat as well as it'll be featured in the view material section going forward this podcast is in the american hospital association really did a focus and a deep dive into talking about uh, behavioral health access related to mobile crisis support services. And so even now moving into hospital associations and things like that, it's a deeper dive and discussion into materials about the impact of mobile teams on cost and on better fit at the better right time versus going to emergency room visits and inpatient units. I uh, went to a couple of different uh, features at the crisis con conference that actually showed data with that and talked about some of the uh, impacts in neighborhoods and communities that mobile teams are having. So check out check out that podcast on the news. And then one of those talks that did reference that was in Crisis Con. And this is a quote from the presentation from Erica Chestnut Ramirez, who's the regional vice president at La Frontera and Impact um, in Arizona. Fascinating discussion about the impact of 911 to 988 diversion in the Arizona model system in the Phoenix area and how it affected some different elements that have been in sync for quite some time and this, how that has changed some of those features. So that was, was probably worth its own topic and, and panel for the future. However, she did a quote, Erica was talking a quote where she talked about with her staff and a messaging that they really reinforce and, and talk about with their staff called out the door and four. And it's basically following the mantra of emergency services like fire that when you're on call as a mobile team, seconds can matter. And so when that call happens, it's not time to go to the bathroom or to go do this. You have to have things in place and a routine ready to move and get out the door in four. 
and be ready to move forward to go out and, and, and make that time matter in terms of arrival from dispatch. So that's a, that's a really good quote, Erica, out the door in four. And now we've had this sort of new feature, the lived experience library, and I'd like to bring on David Covington to introduce my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ursula Whiteside, who was just presenting last week uh, on some of her new material on Now Matters Now. Are you Dr. David? Chuck, Dr. Chuck, thanks so much. And we've been highlighting this transformative work of lived experience and peer supports, recovery stories, starting with William Styron's A Darkness Visible and the host of groundbreaking books. And Marsha Linehan's uh, 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 Building a Life Worth Living is one of the, the watershed moments. Uh, Dr. Ursula Whiteside, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about uh, what this book means to you. You grew up your career in Marsha's lab. Yeah, I think it's it's a kind of a miracle of a book because um, this was not something that she originally planned on doing. In fact, telling her own personal story was um, was something that the idea of terrified her. She she would describe telling that story would be so terrifying to me. And I started working with her as a intake a therapist and participant coordinator in 1999. Before I knew that this was not something that was out, meaning that her experience of having had multiple suicide attempts and psychiatric hospitalization was not well known, um, I had seen you know some scars that she, that she had, and I thought, oh, this is just this is we all know this, and and we ex the, this makes sense, and this is okay. And so when callers would call, they would say like. Uh, I just remember one in particular saying, like, I've read her book. I read her 1993 manual. Um, I'm somebody who has borderline personality disorder. Please tell us that she's she has is one of us. And um, and I said, she, you know, she has had personal experience in this. The relief on this person's voice and just um, just the, sh the shift knowing that was so important. So I'm glad that many years later, 2020, uh, this book was released, but it was certainly uh, a, a work in the making and something that she was scared to do. Uh, in, 20, in 2012, 2013, she came out about her lived experience at the hospital that she'd been hospitalized at for over two years as a young person uh, in front of the staff there and she went and visited people who were on the, on the ward where she'd stayed, which was now a DBT or dialectical behavior therapy ward. So Marsha Linehan, developer of dialectical behavior therapy in this book tells her own story of uh, essentially persistence and that anyone can have the skills or learn the skills to build a life worth living. That's truly her, her belief, even her, even her, the person that, that, um, the clinic that she was staying at that said that she would never live an ordinary life, that she would have to be institutionalized the rest of her life. And boy, what boy was it the opposite of that? That's for sure. Terrific, Ursula. Thanks so much for being here. And hope I uh, hope if folks haven't read the book, uh, they'll add it to their list. And then Ursula, if I could encourage you to hang on and help support, to help support the rest of us, we're going to have a, another hot seat, but this is not for you. You don't, I appreciate you being able to help support us on this. Well, this is going to be for the audience to answer, uh, but it is in, in your sweet spot of expertise and talking about DBT again. So um, the question in the hot seat is more than 40 randomized controlled trials have demonstrated the effectiveness, effectiveness of dialectical behavioral therapy. Originally developed by Dr. Marshall Linehan to treat borderline personality disorder, DBT has also proven effective in reducing suicidal behaviors, self-harm, and improving emotional regulation. So our question is, which of the following is not a primary skill module in dialectical behavioral therapy? So we get a single choice. So while the audience has answered, I, mean, I know you know the answer to this, sir, so we'll kind of walk us through some thoughts on, on how we might be thinking about this as an audience. Yes. So um, this is a pretty technical question. Um, mindfulness is over everything. So this is a major skill module within dialectical behavior therapy and uh, distress tolerance is parallel to mindfulness in the sense that we spend an equal amount of time on that, which is figuring out how to 
get through a crisis without making the situation worse, surviving a crisis. And then radical acceptance is also a, a major skill uh, within one of the other modules. Um, and so, so with that, I would say, do you want me to keep going on this? Sure, this is fascinating. Sure, sure. sure. So, so cognitive restructuring, there are skills that do this, but dialectical behavior therapy has, depending on how you count it, uh, essentially like 50 skills. Um, there are skills that do this, but it's not central. Really, emotions are central to this treatment and learning how to manage and tolerate those emotions. So the audience went with about 38% of cognitive restructuring balanced with radical acceptance at only 35%. So it's pretty close time between those two. And as you can see the answer, cognitive restructuring. Any one last comment on that, Ursula? I would say it's a little bit of a trick question for those that um, selected radical acceptance. They weren't wrong in a way because it, it's not its own module of skills, but is one of the primary skills. So cheers to those people as well. Cheers. Thanks so much, Ursula. Take care. Good to see you. And I'm going to real quickly before our panel starts, we have an international visitor that Megan was going to introduce. It's, she is logging on here at like six o'clock at night in her country to be a part of the crisis jam. Megan? Yeah, we want to welcome um, Madelon, and I'm going to butcher the last name, Madelon. I'm <laughs> Can you say your last name? Because I know in Dutch it's pronounced a certain way. I'm going to try Sineha, but really? Okay, very cool. Very cool. So welcome. Uh, Madelon is a network coordinator for the Dutch International Mental Health Hub. Really glad you're joining us today. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Thanks. You bet. Thanks, Megan. So for our featured speaker today, I'd like to introduce and, and bring on Jennifer Mathis. She's a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, um, oversees the Disability Rights Section, Special Litigation Section, and works with the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section uh, in Immigrants and Employee Rights Select Section. So prior to DOJ, she was the Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health and has done significant work, a key role in Homestead Supreme Court decision, advocating for community integration for individuals with disabilities, a long history of advocating for equal opportunity in areas like healthcare, housing, education, voting. So we're excited to hear you talk to us today about the Civil Rights Divisions and impacts on mental health at the intersection of criminal justice. Take it away, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about the Justice Department's civil rights work at the intersection of mental health and criminal justice. Um, this has been a priority area for our, our work. Um, let me start off by just noting that in the Civil Rights Division, uh, we approach mental health through the lens of disability rights. And um, I think too often mental health is seen only through a lens of access to treatment or access to care. And while access to care is critically important, um, it isn't sufficient. Uh, our goals are broader. And we seek to hold systems accountable to afford people with mental health disabilities the chance to live full and meaningful lives with access to housing, jobs, equal educational opportunity and other important aspects of life. So it's not just access to care. Um, I'm gonna talk about a number of key areas of our work that implicate mental health and criminal justice. Uh, so first, uh, and we can move to the next slide, um, we are doing important work uh, under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act and Olmstead to address mental health system failures that lead not only to unnecessary institutionalization, but uh, also to preventable involvement with the criminal justice system. Last fall, we secured an agreement with Alameda County, California, resolving allegations that its insufficient community services place people with mental health disabilities at serious risk of unnecessary emergency room or psychiatric hospital admission, and also at risk of incarceration. The agreement requires the county to provide timely mental health services uh, throughout the county um, and intensive mental health, housing, and employment services. The agreement addresses planning for people being discharged from psychiatric facilities at the county jail to help strengthen connections to critical mental health services. The agreement also requires the county to reach out and proactively engage with people who have serious mental illness. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, in another Olmstead matter, uh, we recently found that Kentucky's lack of community mental health services results in Olmstead almost experiencing preventable admissions to psychiatric hospitals in the Louisville area, uh, as well as preventable police encounters that have the potential to end in tragedy. Uh, to avoid those outcomes, we indicated in our findings letter, the state must expand crisis services, assertive community treatment, peer support, and housing and employment supports. And that findings is um, something of a companion to findings that we did um, the prior year concerning um, Louisville uh, Metro government and the Louisville Police Department and their responses to people with behavioral health disabilities. Um, the idea is that both the state and the county um, have a role to play here with the uh, provision of alternative responses and the um, set of community services that uh, people need in order to avoid institutionalization as well as uh, law enforcement encounters that can be avoided. So we also issued Olmstead findings in the last couple of years involving people with serious mental illness in South, in adult homes in South Carolina, uh, people with serious mental illness in nursing facilities in three, uh, people with serious mental illness in assisted living facilities and segregated day treatment programs in Nebraska. Each of those findings identified a lack of community services leading to preventable institutionalization and segregation. And while some of those did not focus specifically on criminal justice involvement, I mentioned them uh, with this set of work um, because the same lack of community services, including community crisis services, that places people at serious risk of institutionalization, typically also places them at risk of unnecessary incarceration. Um, and next slide, um, last month, uh, oh, sorry, I, I meant to, um, we were on the slide, uh, if we can go back, thank you. Um, last month, we sued Maine uh, for unnecessarily segregating children with behavioral health disabilities in hospitals, residential facilities, and a state-operated juvenile detention facility in violation of the EDA and the Olmstead decision. We had found that the state used the juvenile detention facility as a de facto children's psychiatric facility. A state commission study found that nearly 70% of young people committed to this juvenile detention facility had received behavioral health treatment through the state in the year before their incarceration. And more than half of the children in the facility who were awaiting placement for more than a month were there only so the state could quote unquote provide care. Um, that study also found that black children were detained at eight times their share of the population and were committed to the juvenile detention facility at five times uh, their share of the uh, population. That is, they were detained at eight times, uh, committed at five times um, their share of the population. Um, so we are seeking to compel the state to provide appropriate home and community-based services, including crisis services, behavior management, individual and family counseling, and other services so that these kids can live at home uh, or in therapeutic foster care. And without these services, many children enter emergency rooms, come into contact with law enforcement, and remain in institutions. We made similar findings concerning the unnecessary segregation of children with mental health disabilities in Nevada and Alaska. Uh, next slide. In both states, we found that children have been stuck for lengthy periods of time in institutions or bounced around between hospitals, shelters, juvenile justice facilities, and residential treatment facilities, often hundreds of miles, in the case of Alaska, thousands of miles from their family homes. In Nevada, we met the parents of a 14-year-old girl who had been institutionalized 47 times in residential treatment facilities in and out of state, hospitals, and juvenile detention centers. Uh, we are also working to stop emergency response systems from violating the rights of people with mental health disabilities. Next slide. Too often, these systems dispatch police as the default response to calls involving people with mental health disabilities, including where they are harming or threatening no one. Often, this results in avoidable arrest, incarceration, and in far too many cases, in tragedy. For black and brown people, such as Deborah Danner and Daniel Prude, 
such outcomes are even more common. In one instance, the manager of a group home in Phoenix, this is from one of our findings reports, um, had called the police because the man had threatened to jump out of a window. When officers arrived, the man told police, I'm trying to die and pulled out a small pocket knife. The officers pointed their weapons and threatened to shoot him if he did not drop the knife. The man took two steps down the stairs. As the first officer said, if you take one step, the second officer fired his teaser, which was not effective. So the man took another step and the first officer shot him three times, killing him. We issued findings concluding that Louisville, Minneapolis, and Phoenix violated the ADA by relying primarily on law enforcement to respond to behavioral health related emergencies. All of those findings are lengthy reports on a variety of issues involving police conduct, but each of them has a section that is specifically focused on the Americans with Disabilities Act and the failure of emergency response systems and of law enforcement agencies to make reasonable modifications in responding to emergency calls involving people with behavioral health disabilities. Along with the Department of Health and Human Services, we also issued guidance on this topic last year, and you can find that guidance by searching for the Department of Justice and Department of Health and Human Services guidance for emergency responses to people with behavioral health or other disabilities. Another relevant area of our enforcement involves crime-free housing programs or nuisance ordinances. Next slide, please. In Anoka, Minnesota, we secured a consent decree earlier this year, resolving our findings that the city had violated the ADA by using a nuisance ordinance to penalize landlords for emergency calls, uh, emergency calls for emergency services at their properties and to encourage them to evict tenants with mental health disabilities. The city has also disseminated regular reports to all landlords identifying specific information about emergency calls including in some cases, the names of people experiencing mental health crises, the names of their therapists, the hospitals to which they were taken and the details of suicide attempts. The city agreed to change these practices to compensate individuals who were harmed by them. I spoke earlier about some of our kids' mental health homestead work, but mental health in schools is also a critical area in preventing needless criminal justice involvement. Our mental health work also includes ensuring that children and youth with mental health disabilities receive the services they need to succeed in school and also addressing campus mental health issues. Um, so in February of this year, we entered a settlement agreement. This one is not on the slides. I forgot to include it. We entered a settlement agreement with Pasco County School District in Florida, resolving our findings that the district routinely suspended students or called police for disability-related behavior that could have been addressed through proper support and de-escalation. Our investigation also found problems with how the district conducted threat assessments. When those assessments involved students with disabilities, the, the district systematically failed to consider the relationship between a student's disability and their behavior, and whether appropriate support for the student would address behavior that prompted the assessment. Instead, the district often unnecessarily referred students to law enforcement to be arrested or start, to start the process for an involuntary admission into a mental health facility under Florida Baker Act. The agreement requires the district to end discriminatory practices under which students lost hours of classroom time, were treated unfairly in the threat assessment process, and face the prospect of being arrested or involuntarily detained in a mental health facility. Um, I'm going to skip the uh, Wichita Public Schools Agreement, but um, you can uh, click on the link if you would like. Um, I think you get the slides. Um, if not, I will happily send it to folks. Um, I uh, want to just mention a statement of interest that we uh, filed in a case brought by students with mental health disabilities alleging that the school system in Palm Beach County, Florida, violated the ADA by failing to make reasonable modifications and relying on law enforcement responses and involuntary detentions of students with behavioral health disabilities. Our statement of interest clarified that public entities like school boards have an obligation under the ADA to reasonably modify their response to disability-related behaviors, even if the child has not made a specific request for such modifications during a disability-related behavior episode. So access to care is important, but adults and children with mental health disabilities also deserve the opportunity 
to participate as full citizens in their communities, um, to receive equal educational opportunity, fair treatment, housing and employment, and to live the same kinds of lives as people without disabilities. And that's exactly what the ADA was designed to achieve with its goals of equal opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. So while we have plenty of work left to do, we are making great strides in advancing those goals. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, that is uh, some powerful things uh, that you shared and really highlights the importance of being successful with developing this crisis system that we talk about and teach and learn in this community to help minimize the involvement of law enforcement and improve uh, boarding and some of the things that you guys are, are acting on in, in the legal system. So for our roundtable, we're going to have uh, two panelists, uh, Debbie Plotnick and Vic Armstrong. So Debbie, would you like to go first and kind of give us your thoughts and comments? We've got about 15 minutes between the, the two of us to, to share. Thank you, Dr. Chuck. <clears throat> um, can you all hear me? We can. Very good, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. And I really want to thank um, Jennifer for her amazing work and the department. I'm Debbie Plotnick. I'm Executive Vice President of State and Federal Advocacy at Mental Health America. And I've been privileged to know Jennifer Mathis over the years and to work with her on a number of projects that prioritize self-determination, that prioritize personhood. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to respond to the, um, the protect these particular initiatives of the Biden-Harris administration, uh, to which Jennifer has brought her legal experience and her perspective of civil and human rights, community supports, and recovery-focused means for addressing crisis and meeting people's needs in the community. Mental Health America clearly supports and has been working to decriminalize people with mental health and substance use disorder needs and divert them out of the criminal justice system and away from justice involvement. We also embrace the concept of deflection, although not named as such in the guide that Jennifer spoke about, aspects of deflection are well represented in the guide for emergency response. The term deflection has come into widespread use here in the US and internationally over the last 10 years. I also have the honor of serving on the executive board of PTAC, the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative that works to further deflection. To put simply, diversion is getting people out of a criminal justice situation, such as arrest, criminal charges, and incarceration, and being in places, the kinds of things Jennifer spoke about. Whereas deflection is literally the prevention of entanglement by any aspect of the justice system. Sometimes this includes, as outlined in the guide, a transitory touch by police officers, as in co-responder teams or in connecting people in need with appropriate behavioral health help and linkage to community-based receiving centers, mobile crisis teams, substance use treatment, all rather than arrest or institutionalization. Mental Health America has long championed CIT training, also spoken about in the guide, and fully agrees that it should be a floor and not a ceiling in crisis response when there are not alternatives to police as first responders. We also fully agree that response must be timely. Thank you for your four minutes, Dr. Chuck, and have a goal of reducing trauma, be it from police encounters, overwhelming emergency departments, or jail. We must not forget that people experiencing a mental health crisis are also likely to have substance use disorder needs, and those experiencing a substance use crisis are conversely likely to have a mental health need. So it's important when crisis response comes for any kind of crisis, that deflection is first and foremost. Mental Health America applauds the work of the administration and the Civil Rights Division and of course, Jennifer, and the fiscal support of the administration in the way that has enhanced Medicaid funding and funding for 988, 
and really is appreciative of state support for building out their continuum of care for the types of programs outlined in the guide that must be provided as follow-up to care. And we really look forward to the um, types of work Jennifer has done and the lawsuits for bringing about more community-based care. Thank you so much. So I'm Vic Armstrong, Vice President of Health Equity and Engagement with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And um, so first, I do want to thank Jennifer for the report. I think the report was, was very informative, um, well put together, and I appreciate all the great information. I think for me, it, it highlights a number of things. One is that as much as we talk about and we continue to talk about uh, stigma against people living with mental health challenges and addictions, um, in reality, what we deal with is discrimination. And I think what the, the, the data that we saw uh, very clearly uh, shows that. When we talk about uh, people living with mental health and, and, and addictions challenges, uh, being more likely to be discriminated against uh, for housing and employment and, and the difficulties in uh, receiving healthcare, um, I think it's, um, it's very clear. I also think that while I applaud the work that's being done, I think it still speaks to the fact that for a lot of people, in order for them to get the resources that they need, is still taking us going through the justice system and having to sue um, systems and having to sue states in order to get the basic uh, resources for people, particularly people who live with uh, with disabilities. And so I think this this report also highlights that. I was very um, um, uh, pleased to hear uh, about the work uh, focusing on the community-based supports. So I think it's very important that we do emphasize people being able to get resources in communities where they live, work, play, and worship. But I think the other thing uh, that I'm hearing from this report as well is that the data very clearly shows that there still is a disproportionate um, impact, uh, a negative impact on people of color. Um, even when we're talking about people that, with disabilities, we're also talking about the intersectionality of people who live with disabilities. And for people who live uh, in black and brown communities and present as black and brown uh, people, there is still that disproportionate negative outcome, uh, particularly in interactions with uh, law enforcement. Even when we looked at the, the data uh, with the young people, when you have uh, black kids eight times more likely to be detained and uh, five times more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system, it again points to the fact that we are still, even as we're making progress, we are still trying to lay resources on top of an inequitable system. And I think that needs to inform a lot of the work that we do going forward, because even as we're talking about how we tweak our system, even going uh, moving forward with the 90 day system, um, we cannot ignore the fact that there's still embedded in our system uh, inequity. And so we're still trying to build um, equity on top of the inequitable system. And then the other thing I would add is that as we're thinking about and continue to do this work, um, that even as we're looking at what those resources need to look like in communities to make sure people have access for those resources, we also need to be mindful that those resources need to be developed with cultural relevancy and need to be developed um, with the guidance of people with lived experience. Because I think, again, we have to be focusing on the end user. Uh, and then the final thing I'll say is that I think um, we really need to think about um, while I uh, understand and appreciate uh, the value of having law enforcement in some situations where um, there is uh, risk of, of harm to others, a risk of harm to that individual, we cannot underscore the fact that um, for people of color who interact with law enforcement in crisis situations, there is a neg there's a disproportionate negative, a disproportionately negative impact for those people of color. And I think that as we're thinking about our system and as our system is evolving going forward, we have to focus on what's in the best interest of the end user. And so as we're um, evolving our system and we have a system that is very much, has been very much based on a law enforcement response, as we evolve that system, there will be, uh, continue to be a role for law enforcement to play. But I think our end goal has to be, how do we get to a point where we are not utilizing law enforcement in responding to people who live with, who, who, 
are experiencing mental health emergencies. Um, and I think that the way that we have to frame these conversations is we have to think about not how do we um, evolve the system in a way that makes the best use of the resources we currently have or uh, makes the smoothest transition from where we are now to where we want to go. But we have to think about how do we create a system that best serves the people who need the resources, not what best serves the system, but what best serves the individual. And I think that if we apply the lessons learned, even today from the report that we heard today, I think there's a lot to be learned about um, how we develop our system going forward. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Vic. And thanks, Debbie. Uh, sounds like I was on mute when I was talking between Debbie and Vic. Uh, Jennifer, if you're able to come back on, there was a question in the chat uh, that we might could dialogue in a few more minutes if you're free to join back on. Sure. So the question from uh, Sonia was, what does the Office of Civil Rights recommend for persons considered to be too acute for to engage meaningfully in voluntary services, but not acute enough from a safety perspective to be um, inpatient or on an involuntary situation because the person is, quote, at baseline, uh, meaning that they're having challenges with living safely and successfully in the community. Um, and she described just seeing uh, new flows daily of people who are kind of cycling through revolving door of hospitalization, incarceration, homelessness. Um, what should we be doing to include them in the continuum of care? And what is the office of civil rights doing and thinking about in that arena? So I would just say that um, I think in every one of the Olmstead matters that we've had, um, there is um, missing in the service system, or not completely missing, but certainly woefully insufficient supply of intensive community-based services. And so, um, you know, when you say, what about the people who, um, you know, can't, that they're not acutely, uh, 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 they're not appropriate for going to a hospital, but, um, you know, their needs are greater than what the community service system um, can provide. I think we have found that, you know, any number of service systems will say, we, you know, we, these people have needs that are too significant to be served um, in our system, but that is because they don't have um, the services that should be there in sufficient intensity and sufficient supply. And most of the Olmstead work is about building um, those services, because um, that has actually, I think, had a significant impact on transforming service systems. And you do see that when service systems have um, have built those services, have expanded those services, um, the, uh, the hospital census has gone down, not because the settlement agreement or a court order has required that, but because that is the natural impact of, of building those intensive services. And so I think that is, in fact, um, often the, the thing that is missing and the thing that's needed is sort of, you know, intensive services that actually function the way they're supposed to and are actually available to people. And that is, I think, at the core of a lot of this work. Um, and I would just say in response to um, the, the point about um, culturally responsive services, which I completely agree with, um, in the Alameda um, settlement agreement, um, and that it was um, somewhat groundbreaking in that there are um, remedies included in there that are aimed at ensuring some cultural responsiveness, um, because in Alameda, I didn't talk about the statistics there, but um, similarly to some of the other uh, matters that I talked about, um, the statistics are pretty stark in terms of um, the impact on people of color and particularly on black people in Alameda County, the impact of the um, sort of lack of community services and the way the system has been functioning. And when you have people cycling in and out of the psych ER and the psych hospital and the jail, it is black people who most often are getting incarcerated and having higher admissions, uh, higher numbers of admissions to the psych hospital. And so um, that agreement, I think, is pretty pretty interesting in that it, it builds in some 
efforts to um, create a culturally responsive system. Thank, thanks for answering the bonus question, Jennifer. That was a great answer and a lot of good information. You know, my, as we go into our next segment, my, there was a whole talk at Crisis Con about the importance of managing higher acuity at the different levels of parity and some of the barriers of change uh, of helping different pillars such as call centers, mobile teams, and crisis stabilization units of being able to support that. And yet that is so important because if you do that correctly, the vast, vast majority of people are going to be supported, just like Debbie talked about, of being completely deflected and not having contact with law enforcement um, if you're able to do that well. And then I guess um, same thing with what Vic was talking about is if you say yes to everyone and you have that layered with layers of trauma-informed care, cultural competence, and those types of things, it creates a much more equitable environment for everyone in crisis. And then Jennifer followed up by talking about the importance of the other layers of the continuum and the follow-up steps in between. So there's answers of things that we need to do to continue to uh, bring this forward, but I really appreciate Jennifer presenting this important topic on this journey for all of us. So now it's time for our SAMHSA update and Dr. Laura House. Are you ready, Laura? I am. Thanks. Can you see my my video? I'm looking to see. Are you sure able can. to see me? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I just wanted to bring uh, a few brief um, updates from SAMHSA. And it's primarily regarding some upcoming events that we are having, training and development events. Uh, our Crisis Technical and Training Center will be hosting uh, several webinar series, and we invite you to join us. Uh, this includes a webinar on November 14th from 2 to 4 Eastern Standard Time, focusing on children, youth, and family, uh, understanding children, youth, and family services across the Crisis Continuum series. And it's session two in our children, youth, and family uh, series. And then we also have a, another webinar on December 3rd uh, from 11 to, 12, 11 to 1 Eastern Standard Time, and that one focuses on budgeting for equity. Uh, and that is a part of our embedding equity webinar series uh, for 988. Uh, and then finally, we have a workshop that we are um, hosting on December 12th from at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that one focuses on older adults and behavioral health crisis. And so we invite you to all of those webinars. We also will be having our 3C session, um, just talking about the services and the resources in general um, being offered by our Crisis TTAC on November 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And then finally, I wanted to uh, announce uh, that we will be having uh, a special webinar tomorrow um, two webinars actually tomorrow uh, from 11.30 to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's uh, part of our 988 Call for the Culture HBCU National Initiative. Uh, and we'll be focusing on how uh, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline um, is changing crisis responses uh, for the community uh, and really focusing on building, uh, addressing suicide and building mental wellness and resilience on HBCU campuses and in HBCU communities. So please join us for all of those activities. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Howe. Thanks for sharing those resources and information. Now we've got our Nashville update with Elizabeth Hay. Yes, hi. Hi, Chef. Nice to see you. Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone, or actually good morning or even good evening to our international call. You're joining us from, from Denmark. But uh, as 
I'm Elizabeth Hank, and I'll be providing the Nashbit update this week. And I'm thrilled to be doing so because what I'm here to share, I think, is really um, on theme with a great presentation we heard from, from Jennifer um, earlier. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Connected and Strong uh, Technical Assistance Coalition paper series that was published just last month. Uh, which comprises a series of 10 papers that reflects really SAMHSA's and NASHBID's current best thinking toward advancing SAMHSA's vision of crisis care that is available 24-7 and responsive to wherever the person is located. Um, and I'll be sure to uh, put the link in the chat for you all to um, so you can take a look. And Connected and Strong is part of, is the latest of the Beyond Bed series, which is uh, really started in 2017 um, through a partnership with SAMHSA and NASHBID around um, the idea of moving beyond beds, beyond this at the time. And, and really now, too, there is this constant call for um, building more beds to, to solve the problems we are seeing in the capacity and lack of capacity within the mental health system. Um, and the, the first paper, Beyond Beds, was a way to really move beyond thinking about just building more beds and towards a more systems thinking approach and understanding the importance of a Fulton continuum of psychiatric care, just like Jennifer was talking about needing, um, you know, those community um, supports uh, in addition to, to help support people. Um, and so I wanted to highlight related to this presentation, a few of the papers as part of the Connected and Strong series that were, that were relevant to um, what we're talking about today. And the first is on um, 988 and 911 collaboration and provide some strategies for developing those important partnerships to promote that 988 and 911 collaboration as we're moving towards and uh, moving away from law enforcement as the de facto responder to someone in the community in crisis. And it provides um, some important um, partners of who, a list of who needs to be at the table um, for these, for effective collaboration, as well as a lot of great state examples that others can look towards for um, some ideas about how to develop these strong partnerships to um, really get off the ground the 988 and 911 collaboration. Um, the second paper I wanted to highlight is on utilizing technology to enhance access for crisis care. Um, and it includes a discussion of opportunities for technology to facilitate the interaction between the crisis system, law enforcement, EMS, emergency departments, and others to improve outcomes for individuals experiencing a crisis. And again, as shown on the screen here, um, provides a lot of great um, both state and local jurisdiction examples of how to utilize technology to um, increase access to care. And then finally, I wanted to highlight um, one um, and perhaps my favorite of the series uh, related to peer support services ac across the crisis continuum. And this one really provides um, is a roadmap for both why and how to incorporate peer support into every aspect of the of the crisis continuum um, and is a great um <laughs> yeah, and, and written by my colleague, Amy, who just read in the chat, um, and, and Justin Volpe at Nashville, um, and is a great read, and I'll make sure to put that in the chat for everyone. Um, and I don't have a slide here, but I also wanted just to mention our upcoming um, series, which is Advancing Crisis Care and Beyond, which will be hopefully released by the end of this year, or early next year. Um, wanted to highlight a few papers in that series that are relevant to the discussion today that Jennifer has mentioned, one on uh, measurement-based care and school mental health and, and how to utilize measurement-based care and in school mental health to um, really improve outcomes, um, as well as one on the crisis services continuum for, for youth um, and really focusing on um, increasing supports for in-home um, treatments to avoid those um, out-of-home placements for, for youth in crisis. Um, so thanks, Jack. Back to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Those are uh... Labors of labors of love and very very great papers uh, to read and, and see and shout out to Amy who's on today got a little woohoo in there um, in, for for her uh, paper with Justin Tom Tom Betlock is coming in to do our Medicaid front and center Doctor Chuck can you hear me okay we can hear you great Tom 
Excellent. So, boy, first, I'm glad I was not on the hot seat today. That was a tough question. So, um, on Medicaid front and center today, we're going to continue our discussion in terms of thinking about the partnership between Medicaid and developing a comprehensive, sustainable crisis system. So, the importance of Medicaid, you know, is obvious in terms of its ability to help finance those systems. And at the end of the day, Medicaid is a healthcare financing program, right? So. How do we think about the opportunities to really leverage that to continue to develop the comprehensive sustainable crisis systems that we want in our communities to address the types of issues that we've been talking about today in terms of developing comprehensive services for individuals in need. So, you know, this is going to get a little techy and a, a, a little bit down in the weeds, but I think it's important for people to understand as states move through their budget cycle. Right now, states are in, most states are in the process where governors are developing their budget, getting ready to go to the legislative session. So it's important to recognize the opportunity to leverage Medicaid, to leverage that federal match, um, to really bring those dollars in to help sustain crisis services. So as you're thinking about you know, partnering with your Medicaid agency, as you're thinking about going to the governor's office, as you're thinking about going to the legislature to look for resources, I just wanted to touch on a few important themes today as it relates to Medicaid. And that is just, we're gonna start with the federal match and the percentage that each state's receive. So if you don't know your state's percentage, I would encourage you to go look at Kaiser Foundation. You know, they have a comprehensive set of data that looks at what a state's match rate is, but the match rate ranges from 50-50. So in essence, for every dollar a state puts up, it can receive a dollar back in federal funding to help support those services all the way up to 76.9%. And this percentage is based upon the personal income of a state. So states vary through this range of 50% to 76.9%. So when you think about a 76.9% match, that's over a three to one. So for every $1 the state puts up, it's receiving $3 in federal funding. So you can see there's quite a range in terms of what states get in federal funding to help support their Medicaid programs. Now. Medicaid is not simple, right? We know that. So um, as part of that complexity, there's all kinds of different matching rates. The ACA expansion population for adults receives a 90-10. So for every $10 the state puts up, it gets back $90 from the federal government to be able to spend on services. We know that there's enhanced funding for mobile crisis services, 85%. Um, and we know that's available for 12 fiscal quarters or, or three years as a state ramps up it's mobile crisis infrastructure, the federal government's willing to pay an enhanced match. But what's important to note is, if you have individuals that are in that ACA expansion population, you're getting 90% for that. So you even get a higher rate for that population. And then there's other match rates, you know, we won't spend a lot of time on, but there's 100% for tribal services delivered at an IHS or 638 facility. And then there's a program called CHIP that provides coverage for kids sort of above the Medicaid uh, limit. And so that's uh, a 15 percentage point increase above the state's traditional federal matching percentage. Next slide. So let's just look at how this impacts on a real life basis uh, for the, the ability to leverage federal dollars in a Medicaid program to help sustain those crisis services. So for a $200 claim, let's say for mobile crisis services, you know, the, the state has to put up $30 at that enhanced match of 85.15. They're able to draw in $170 from the federal government, right? And so they're saving that amount above their traditional match. So if it's 50-50, they're saving quite a bit of money, right? They're saving the difference between 30 and $100 or $70. Um, you know, for an expansion adult, they're, they're only putting up $20 for $180 to be able to draw down in federal money for a $200 claim. Managed care gets more complex. Those percentages are still passed through to managed care in terms of what the state can draw in, uh, but it's more complex formula. But just to know that as you look at the opportunity to leverage federal dollars, Dr. Chuck, states really need to look at, advocates need to be engaged on, people need to understand how these matching rates work and the leverage that's really available as it relates to drawing down federal funds to help support crisis systems in our states. That's important stuff, Tom, and I'm glad I am not on a hot seat question quizzing my competency and understanding all these as you just explained it. So um, thanks thanks for that information. We, um, we're we going to, I wanted to ask you a question from uh, 
Miss Math, I think we're running out of time and I'm going to have to go over to crisis talk. I was going to put you on the spot to ask about the Phoenix cases and the uh, police things, but we'll cover that for another time because I do need to get to uh, Commissioner Tanner and, and Stephanie. Thanks, Tom. So I'd like to introduce Stephanie to uh, be able to lead in and talk about crisis talk with Commissioner Kevin Tanner from Georgia and talking about 86 in mental health stigma in Georgia. Well, we featured, I don't know if you knew this or not, uh, Commissioner, but you were featured in the pre-show last week, the 988 video uh, for Georgia in response to um, the shooting that was done on 11 Alive and had the 988 feature interviewed you and had the peer support uh, worker talking about their role. That was a really powerful uh, video. So, Stephanie and, and Commissioner Tanner. Thanks, Dr. Chuck. Um, so, Commissioner Tanner, uh, you shared that some of the lessons learned, but I wanted the audience to hear them um, about the 86, the stigma 988 campaign. Can you talk a little bit about the on the ground approach, how it started and any lessons learned? Yeah, I'm happy to. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. So this actually, this idea actually came from one of our uh, staff members interacting with the Restaurant Worker Association. And one of the things we quickly realized in looking at the data in Georgia and really across the country, uh, we all know that different work classes have different rates of suicides. And one of the things we saw very early on was that restaurant workers have an unusually high suicide rate. And as a result of that, we partnered with the Restaurant Worker Association to create a hashtag 86 the stigma. I think most of you probably at some point in your life may have worked around the restaurant industry and know that 86 means to um, get rid of it. We don't have it anymore. 86 the cheese, that type of thing. So we wanted to use terminology that restaurant workers were familiar with. So we partnered with them. Uh, we reached, I think, around 60 million impressions in this campaign over the time that we did it. Uh, our restaurant workers wore hats that said 86 the stigma. They had their pens they used, had 86 the stigma. Uh, other things within the restaurant had that. And uh, it reached, uh, reached a lot of people and uh, got a lot of attention. And we got a lot of great feedback. Uh, into our uh, into our marketing campaign, and I believe it also had the nine eight eight number when they were on the pens and the the different marketing materials. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. We we used it to market nine eight eight. We're doing some working on some similar campaigns in the construction industry, which also has a high uh, suicide rate. Uh, we also have started a campaign called the Faith and Farm Initiative, our agriculture community here in Georgia has a high suicide rate. And we've also done a lot of work just recently uh, with the hurricane, a couple of hurricanes that's come through Georgia. Uh, we saw an increase in mental health crises in our South Georgia area. So, uh, but yes, it, it definitely was used to market 988. And it sounds like this tailored approach and now you're using it again with these different populations. One thing that stood out to me was that uh, you're really looking at the data. Um, if you don't mind very briefly talking about how the data determines what populations you're going to market to next when it comes to 988 and tailoring messages. Yeah, I'm, I'm a numbers guy personally um, and various things that I've done in my public service career. And I believe that we should be very data driven with the decisions that we're making and how we're investing our finite resources. So that's um, looking at what the data shows around who has the highest rates of suicide, who is calling 988 at the highest rate, where those individuals are located uh, is important to us. So uh, that's what led us to make the decision to invest specifically in this campaign. It's also what's leading us to invest in our agriculture community and our construction industry. Also, we feel like we can have the greatest impact and receive the highest return on investment uh, by these targeted investments. And uh, the other thing that I think is important that we're doing is once the campaign's over, is to really go back and tabletop and look at what went right, what went wrong, and learn from the good things, and also maybe learn from some of the things that we could have done better. Uh, so that's something that we're continuing to do and really continuing to track this data 
uh, as we continue to roll out our marketing efforts here in Georgia on 988. Thank you so much for joining me, Commissioner Tanner, and I'll pack, pass it back to you, Dr. Chuck. Thanks, Commissioner Tanner. Thanks, Stephanie. So coming up soon, uh, our next episode, we'll have Nashville Workforce Resource Guide with Wendy Morris. And the following week for episode 197, I believe, uh, yes, it's uh, it's going to be uh, Mara Weinstein doing Pew's Mental Health and Justice Partnerships. We also have a future debate upcoming with my good friend, uh, Aaron, Aaron Foster, who's going to be doing a debate with someone internationally, uh, Renee. Um, Dr. Renee, and I cannot even see the name to pronounce it correctly on the tilt on the on the show, but they, they did this debate in the Crisis Jam and are going to be featuring it again. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing, as Dr. Keith, that's correct, to hear them uh, kind of read, uh, discover, and discuss this. And, and they're basically talking about the pros and cons of having peer support specialists in crisis. Uh, it's a fascinating discussion and really, I know, has resonance for us here in the States. Um, and so tune into that. Our time is up for the one o'clock. I think we're going to leave you with our pre-show video from the Oklahoma 988 of our uh, center call center critters video again, just to make sure you've got some baby shark or schoolhouse rock type of tones playing in your head for the rest of the day. Thank you. Sometimes friends get a case of the jitters, bad thoughts swirling around like a ditch full of litter. And live, it's not rainbows, it's not all glitter. Gotta pick up the phone, call me in a critter, call a text. 988, call a text. 988 call or text 988 when you're more fried than a well done fritter or you're down in the ninth and you need a pinch hitter call or text 988 call or text 988 oklahoma's mental health lifeline nice love that last 988 thank you everyone